Welcome to the Legacy Pioneers Oral History Initiative, a part of the Bronx Latino History Project. Today is Tuesday, October 3, 2023. My name is Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian and archivist for the Bronx County Historical Society. Today, I am joined by Nick Lugo here at his offices on 116th Street between 3rd and Lexington Avenue at his uh, travel agency that his father founded uh, some many, many decades ago. Um, Nick Lugo is a graduate of the Inter-American University of Puerto Rico in San Germán, where he majored in business administration. He entered the travel and publishing businesses at a young age as an apprentice to his father, the founder of Gofresi Travel Agencies and Temas Magazine, where Nick served as associate publisher. Mr. Lugo is the former National Executive Director for the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico offices in the United States and the former head of Puerto Rico's Migration Division. His list of accomplishments, accomplishments are great and they're just too long to list, but we will discuss them during the interview. Welcome, Mr. Lugo. Hello, Chris. Well, how are you? I'm doing well. Did, did uh leave anything out on the introduction? No, no, you didn't. Uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, some other things, but we'll get into it as we go along. Great, great. And we, we like to start out all of our oral histories by asking, you know, uh, your family background, family history. Where are your parents from? Tell us a little about each of them. Yeah. Well, uh, my mother is from Arecibo. And in Arecibo, uh, there's a little town called Garrochalis. And so uh, she was born there. And uh, it's a great place. Little, um, uh, how can I call it? You know how you get those old wooden homes and they're on stilts? Right. And I remember very well that I used to go there and underneath the home was the wires that you put uh, uh, along the bottom so that the animals don't get out. And we used to have roosters and pigs and uh, all these sapos. Uh, everything was kind of inside of there overnight. And I remember uh, that uh, my grandmother used to make coffee in the morning. And uh, you can never get over the smell, the aroma, uh, and the sock that was <laughs> about 30 years old already. And they used to, every time that there was a hole, they used to needle it up. And they kept on reusing, and the flavor just kind of stuck. And I can never forget the mango tree that was outside and the avocado tree and uh, the smell of the coffee. So... Um, that was in Arecibo. Then my father was from San Germán, Puerto Rico. And as you know, that's in the uh, southwest of the island and uh, near Mayaguez and uh, near Hormigueros, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of interesting because Hormigueros also is where Ramon Vélez uh, was born and came from. And my father was in the town right next to it. So it's funny that these it, two would eventually meet here in New York and kind of form a bond and work together to the benefit of the Hispanic market. Uh, while my father was uh, a young kid, mm -hmm. he was a sugarcane cutter at the age of eight. And he did all kinds of odd jobs all day long he was working from morning until it was time to go to sleep. And then it was routine for him to do the same thing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so uh, his friends that he used to have, I guess, and I can't really say, but can you imagine them getting together in the morning so that they can walk together to where they had to mm -hmm. cut the sugar cane and the coffee and uh, other types of agricultural uh, products that had to be uh, cosechada. So uh, needless to say, it was not an interesting youth that my father had. 
uh, but it was something that kind of groomed him for the future. It taught him how to attack life in a very aggressive way, how to understand the torment that life brings at a young age. It taught him how to survive and be on top of it all and how to make friends in order to influence other people. And so he became a very good student of learning how to talk and be with people. And he was quite charismatic as the years went by. Uh, but he never ever forgot that youth that he had, which was very indulging. It was very difficult for him to be in the fields working hard labor at such a young age. When we look at uh, the lives that some of us have met, uh, I for one used to play basketball, and I used to play baseball, and uh, I used to be into sports. And so there were a lot of things that uh, I didn't know as I was growing up, which I found out later. Um, but uh, as soon as I could work, I had no problem not in saying no or yes, I had no choice. Mm -hmm. My father took me to work with him. And I started working at a young age, going to the office and watching things. And after school, that's where I, I would be. I would go to the office. Uh, you had to kind of, even at that age, I remember I made a quarter a week that my father would give to me, 25 cents. And I thought I was a millionaire right. with a quarter in my pocket. As long as I could buy a small bean, which were in those days for five cents or 10 cents. And you took that small bean and put it in your pocket. And whenever you get a free moment, you would play stickball or you would play off the wall or you would play box ball. You would do something with the small bean, even bouncing it up and down, throwing it up in the air and catching it getting two people and playing catch back and forth. So that small bean became really uh, as though uh, you could get away from it all. And then you would finish playing and go back to work. Mm -hmm. And at nighttime, I would go home with my father and then study. You know, in those days, as a youngster, you don't really have to work a lot, but you have to understand what you're doing. And so uh, I kind of got it at a young age and I knew that I would have to work all my life. I just wanted to choose what I would work in. And I wanted to make sure that uh, I did what was necessary in order to achieve success. It wasn't until later in life that I kind of felt that, you know, doing just what you need to do is not enough. And so you have to indulge more and you have to study more and you have to really get into the nitty gritty because life tests you along the way. And you have to have something that you want to get to. And so my goals was always to learn as much as I could. And inside the back of my head was always the fact that I wanted to run the travel agencies, that I wanted to help my father, especially when I found out his past. And so uh, I wanted to be his right-hand person. And so I worked hard and learned as much as I could. Uh, and so uh, I did go to Puerto Rico and started college at the Inter-American University. I thought I was going to go into politics, mm -hmm. uh, but as time went by, I decided that politics is not something that I wanted to be a politician, but I did want to dabble in politics, and I wanted to use the trade in order to benefit the travel agencies. And remember that in those days, there was a lot that was happening because everything was just starting. Mm -hmm. 
So in the South Bronx on Westchester Avenue and Prospect, that used to be the hub for the Puerto Rican community. And so that's where everybody moved into first. And then they would go and kind of find their way north and eventually wind up in Hunts Point, you know, or in Southern Boulevard, and then Hunts Point, and then Commonwealth, uh, Soundview, and then Throds Neck. Mm -hmm. And then from there, that you cross the bridge and you get into New Jersey and uh, also into Rockland County. Uh, a lot of Hispanics also went into where they had Las Villas. And that was the kind of what you would almost say were the Jewish Alps for the Puerto Ricans, where okay. we would go there and spend the weekend, and there was music playing in all of these villas. There, uh, uh, La Villa Galicia, La Villa Nueva, there was about 10 of them. Okay. And people would just go there, and they had, it was like a small resort. And then there were little uh, hotels, motels, and you would stay there, and everybody would be there with the family, and you would stay outside, uh, and you would talk. And everybody, all, all the fathers and the mothers, the mothers would talk kitchen, and the fathers would talk uh, business. Mm -hmm. And the kids would play. And so a lot of the kids would start playing instruments and uh, get into music. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was a, a very endearing time. Uh, and then that didn't happen every weekend right. so that when you got back into New York City, uh, it's like uh, you're now beginning all over again to notice what it's like. Mm -hmm. And reality kind of seeps in and you realize that everybody's got a job and they have something to do and everybody is kind of uh, doing um, networking with each other and with other politicians. So uh, I kind of was involved in all of that. And my father would take me wherever he went. So I got to meet uh, all of the older politicians. Uh, I was probably the only kid that was with them. So I got to know them. And I went to dinner with my father and listen to the conversations. Uh, I went to political meetings and listened to what they were planning to do and what were the problems that they were facing. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of was immersed into the life of a Puerto Rican in P and we were the majority. Mm -hmm. uh, there weren't that many other Hispanics here and there, you would find a, a Dominican, or you would find a uh, South American or a Central American, but they were very few and far between. Mm -hmm. The hub was Puerto Rican. And so how do you get jobs? You know, uh, who was the person that dispersed the jobs? How do you, once you find the job, how do you help other people to get jobs? And so... I saw when I was then growing up the beginning of the social clubs where San Germán would start a club San Menu, mm -hmm. and you would have a club Rio Piedras or a club San Juan. Right. Uh, you would have a club Aguadilla, which actually would be all of the residents that were here that were from that town would join that club. Right. And then we would have domino tournaments and we would play against each other. And wow. so I would get to meet the people from the different towns. And so my father would be able to pick up in those days all of those clubs to buy the travel from the travel agency. And so it was weaving and it was a form of marketing that no one knew right. that that was marketing. You were out there trying to establish yourself and your brand so that people would come to you. And if they needed something, 
you were who they came to. And so, Agencia Scofrasi, which was born, I'll get into how that happened, but because the travel agency was born, and the first agency was in the South Bronx, it became the social center, where if you needed notary, that's where you went to get your notary. If you need papers to fill out, that's where you went to get the papers filled out. Translations, you would go there. Uh, if you needed insurance, if you bought a car, or if you needed insurance for any reason, that's where you went. Mm -hmm. So that it became an all-service agency catering to the Hispanic, which were mostly 80% or 85% Puerto Rican. And it became the social center because right next door to it was a billiard hall. And so my father found that by taking the billiard hall, he could host when the billiard hall used to be full on weekends, mm -hmm. my father could have during the day meetings in there and bring all the people together. And the billiard hall was huge. Right. And so you could fit about 200 people in there. And so my father would kind of host these meetings in there and find out what the families were in need of. Uh, is it an apartment? Is it some way of uh, getting help for your daughter or your son or yourself or your family. And so my father uh, and uh, me through osmosis, you might say, was able to sit, I was able to sit there and look and see how these members of the community in those days got together and were able to help the community because they had nowhere else to go. Right. And so the community just kept on growing and expanding north. As it expanded north, we opened up another travel agency on Southern Boulevard in West Farms Road. As it kept going further north, we opened up another travel agency in um, uh, Soundview Avenue. Okay. Then we opened up another one in Throg's Neck. If you go to Brooklyn, and Brooklyn also was where a lot of Hispanics were coming into. So on Grand Avenue, we opened up a travel agency there. And so what we did is keep in touch with the Hispanic as they grew and as their needs grew also. And because we grew with the community, we became the travel agency of preference in every aspect of the Hispanic market. Uh, my father became a real estate broker. And so when it got to the point that people wanted to buy a home or a co-op, mm -hmm. uh, especially when in the South Bronx, they started building, uh, there was this guy named Sam Lott and Romero who were the first developers, Hispanic, Puerto Rican, and they opened up. And so my father, they gave all the apartments to my father to rent out. So my father would take and give it out to the people. He had applications come in and these people were able to do that. Uh, St. Athanasius was the church that was there that uh, in those days there was Father Steltz. Eventually we had uh, Father Bonanno uh, and then finally we had Father Gigante. Father Gigante really got involved. And so he and my father and a few other people, when he started developing, we were able to give him a lot of people that he was able to put into his apartments. And so the church maintained all of their constituents mm -hmm. so that people wouldn't leave the area and go to another church. So in the church, we also had a baseball team. We had a basketball team. And so we were able to get these people to join and get involved into an area that we didn't have before. And so I guess we saw that, you know, sports plays a big role 
in people's lives. And so Kofresi began to sponsor. We created little leagues in softball and baseball and basketball. And we had these leagues throughout the city. And what we did was we played them against each other. And we had people actually running the leagues. And uh, it turned into, we had financially, we had nothing to do with it. The people who ran those leagues were put there at the beginning. We started them and then they took them over. And they found a way to make money with it. But in every league, we had a team, Cofresi. And we would play Goya. We would play Marabé. El que muda como es, if you remember those things, Valencia Bakery. Right. And so uh, all of the players, all of the teams were sponsored by the growing new uh, members of the Hispanic community that uh, were taking hold, like Panco Popular, right. that came in in those days. El Ponce de Leon Bank. So that's. You can see as I, I, it, it didn't happen fast, but it was happening. And you knew that you wanted to happen, so you worked towards the goal mm -hmm. to make sure that people didn't leave the neighborhood, but that they could somehow survive and that their kids could be taken care of while they worked. And so you had a lot of community centers over. And then, of course, a lot of people started getting very, uh, as you get more and more and more, you know, when you have a lot of people spending a lot of money and creating a neighborhood, mm -hmm. now you can look at grants, you can look at uh, the government to help you out, um, and the politicians. If you vote and you elect your people, now you have your people in office. Mm -hmm. So in those days, you used to have uh, Salvador Almeida, uh, you had Herman Vadillo, of course, uh, you had uh, most of the uh, Irma Vidal Santaella, who was an attorney, who actually uh, wasn't a politician, but she was. She was political in her views. Okay. And so she had a very good connection with Doña Fela, which was Felisa Rincon, which was the mayor of San Juan, who always believed in kind of putting together the community of New York, the neo rican mm -hmm. with Puerto Rico. And I'm not sure that everybody that was in Puerto Rico wanted that, right. but Fela was the type of person that she was very loving. She was a mother to all. And so she would come often, and we would meet with her, and I knew her since... Around what year was that? Well, you know, it's hard to pinpoint the years, but I, you can you can talk about these things happening in the 60s, okay. late 50s. You know, I mean, everything started before right. all of that. I mean, the worst part was in the 40s. Uh, in the 30s, when my father got here, you didn't have anything. And so he was one of the very few Hispanics that came over here at that time. Uh, so... And he didn't know how to read or write. So here comes a guy that didn't have any education, had nothing. He could not speak English, could not write. So had no friends. Uh, he spoke Spanish, but how many people could speak Spanish? So that uh, he was very limited. I guess the good thing in those days was that because there weren't a lot of Hispanics yet, mm -hmm. so a lot of people would help you. You're the person that needed help. And so if you're around and you do no wrong and people see you working and trying to kind of raise a family, well, in those days you didn't have a family, but if they see you working hard, a lot of people noticed and they helped my father. And when he finally got his big break, it was when he was working at where, what they call Tavern on the Green today. Okay. Right? Central uh, Park. In Central Park. 
And so that was called something else. I can't recall the name. But he was mopping the floors when there was a banquet which ended. And he was there, and his job was to mop the floors and so on and so forth. And he was mopping what, the floors. What age was he at that time when he got here in the 30s? Well, you got to figure he was born in 1902, so he must have been about 19, 20. Okay. You know, uh, maybe 21. Very young. Pre, pre Puerto Rican air migration. Yeah, yeah, so pre migration. Your father's one of the pioneers of yeah. New Yorkans. Yeah. Well, I gotta, we'll talk to you about the migration part of it also because sure. it plays a big role into why, who we are and why we're here. Right. But the thing was that he was mopping floors and he happened to see a table that was still there talking. And so he kind of mopped around them and finally he went to the table and so... He introduced himself because he wanted, he was curious and he needed help and he wanted to meet people. And, you know, these people were very, uh, seemed to be to him very wealthy. Uh, they didn't have to be, but they were way above his mm -hmm. stature. And it turned out that it was Pan American World Airways okay. that was doing the banquet. And at the table, was the president of Pan American Airways, Juan Tripp. Juan Tripp was a Spaniard, and he was the president of Pan American Airways. Wow. And so when my father went there, and he said hello, and uh, and they saw him that he was uh, mopping, it was Juan Tripp who said hello to him. And before you knew it, they were talking in Spanish. And so Juan Tripp gave his business card to my father. And my father said he was going to be in touch with him. The very next day, my father went to Pan American headquarters. And so he went up to the floor and he gave the card to the lady that was there. And they went inside and Juan Tripp came out and brought my father into his office. And they had a conversation in Spanish. And my father said to him, Pan American is going to start flying to Puerto Rico. Now remember, my father didn't come here on an airplane. That's right. He came here on a ship. Okay. And we call the name? Marine Tiger. And that's why every Hispanic in those days they were called Marine Tiger. Oye, Marine Tiger, como tu esta? Why? Because it was like a fraternity. They all came on the, on the ship, Marine Tiger. That was the ship that used to come to El Salvador. Okay? And so, when Pan American, my father, uh, became friends with uh, one trip, and he would go there often, because one trip says you have to raise $5,000 and put up a bond in order to have a travel agency. And so he said, I want to name your travel agency, the first Hispanic travel agency. And so my father started putting every penny he got into the Bank of America, which was on Madison Avenue and 116th Street, right here in the corner. Okay. And so my father kept working and he didn't do anything except save money. And he put the money into Bank of America. And he kept going to see one trip and saying to him, look at my book. I got $800. Look at my book. I got $1,200. Look at my book. I got 2000 Look at my book. And so... What happened was that eventually, uh, eventually, they found uh, he had something like about thirty-five, thirty-seven hundred dollars. Bank of America went bankrupt. You didn't have FDIC insurance in those days. 
And so what happened was that my father lost all his money. And my father was depressed and he goes to one trip. And one trip saw what he was doing and how long it was taking him. And what happened at that point was nothing short of a miracle. One trip said to him that he was going to put the money up and that he was going to give my father the travel agency, which was a permit in those days by the airline to sell Pan American tickets. Okay, and you couldn't sell anything else. Right. And so my father opened up the travel agency over there after I think it was six or seven months. And uh, I think the rent was nothing like about $75 a month in those days. And uh, he worked it himself. And he opened it up and, you know, my mother was working with him, uh, the family, whoever, you know, he had family from other places. You know. Everybody chipped in, nobody got paid. And so the agency, it picked up right away because all the people in the area needed the service and mm -hmm. there was nowhere else they could go. And they didn't, a lot of people didn't understand uh, English. So here you go, and you have what you call an isolated business that no one knew. And so uh, as time would have it, uh, the agency grew. And there came a time, my father paid, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, what? The money that was, my father paid it to him. And uh, one trip made him exclusive. He could go nowhere else to get an airline ticket, to go to Puerto Rico. So what happened? So one trip, when they opened up Pan American Airways to fly to San Juan, Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico was desperate. Why? Because they had a lot of sugar cane cutters. And they did, couldn't employ them because they were not skilled laborers. Puerto Rico had a problem because how do you care for all these people? And so Puerto Rico needed to put up the money to be able to, otherwise a lot of people would die. And so there was a lot of hunger, no jobs. Um, sugar cane uh, was kind of, uh, it was okay, but it wasn't the crop that gave enough money so that you could run a whole economy on it. Mm -hmm. And eventually the train that used to carry the sugar canes. Right. So when it didn't pay off, they started dismantling the train. So now how do you get the sugar cane that you could get to where it should be? And so transportation, so they were killing the industry right but you had the leftover which was all of these people that used to work it you saw how these people were very nice people but they had no education so what did they do so puerto rico decided you know we got to do something and so pan american airways and the government of puerto rico decided, why don't we migrate them into New York? Just like what is happening now in migration, where people are leaving because they say there's nothing for them where they live and where they were born. So they all want to come. Why? Mm -hmm. Because they want to make good living. So what happened was that in Puerto Rico, they put a flyer and they distributed it throughout the whole island, where they show that a block in New York mm -hmm. was made out of gold, okay? And that if you come to New York, man, you're gonna be rich. You don't have to worry about it. The gold is in the streets. And you know, these poor people that have no education, they bought into the fact that let me go to New York. Right. 
So, you know, that's when more or less my father had just been here when all of this migration and he was there. Right. And so Pan American needed somebody in Puerto Rico. And so they actually opened up an office in San Juan, in old San Juan, in La Calle Tanca, Esquina Tetuan. Got it. You know where it is? No. Okay. So in old San Juan, it's across the street from the telephone building. Okay. Puerto Rico telephone in those days. So they opened up the office and they gave it to my father. To run. What year was that? That well, that was more or less. Uh, you, it's got to be in the fifties. I can't remember the, the exact years, okay. but it had to be in the fifties. So then, now my father had an office here, and he had an office in Puerto Rico. Didn't have to worry about the office in Puerto Rico. Pan American was taken care of. And so, my father had the permit. His name was on it. Cofresi and Cofresi here. And so we were the first travel agencies in the United States completely, wow. Hispanic, and the first travel agency to bridge Puerto Rico and New York, New York and Puerto Rico, wow. with Pan Am being the major carrier. Okay? So now, what happens? People started coming in droves. The airplanes were full. Pan American flew full to Puerto Rico. And remember that in those days, there was a lot of tourism going to Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And all these tourists would go and stay at the hotels in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and they couldn't now. Okay? But coming back, you had a lot of migrants coming here. Mm -hmm. And so... Now, the old man had New York over here and Puerto Rico over here. Now, the people that were here were beginning to learn savvy and, and their kids that were young were now in school. And there were a lot of other activities for seniors, for them to kind of learn the ropes and learn a little English. And so all of a sudden, you're wakening up, not a giant, but you're wakening up a, a dormant right. situation. And so all these people are now getting smart. And they know that the only road to success is that you got to learn. You got to work hard, which they all had good work habits. They just didn't know how to negotiate salaries, how to negotiate what they did. Mm -hmm. And so they would accept the job paying low salaries, but they would keep it because they could pay for their home, their apartment. And so all of a sudden in Puerto Rico, because Puerto Rico, all the laborers were all over the island. So Pan American said, got to open up another office. In Arecibo, we opened up. Okay. And then we had to open up another office. In the end, we had 11 offices in Puerto Rico. And as people started over here, and my father, remember, got into real estate. So we started getting uh, real estate brokers. And my father learned English, broken English. But let me tell you, he learned English. Mm -hmm. His, he knew how to use the words and knew how to talk to the people. And so he came in contact with a lot of people and because he was very charismatic, he was able to make friends and allies. And so he would set up all these people as they moved from neighborhood to neighborhood and he would open up an office also there and have a franchise set up and have somebody like yourself maybe take over the office and you would follow the example of what we did at the main office. And so you would keep on doing that. And as the years went by, we wound up with 52 travel agencies. And Puerto Rico, we eventually sold off because it was very difficult to maintain. In those days, you didn't have computers. 
if we would have had computers, right. we would have been able to open up more offices, not only in Puerto Rico, and we had an office in Santo Domingo, because when their migration started, we had an office there too. And so we used to take care of the Dominican market, and Balaguer in those days was very good friends with my father. And so we were able to help the Dominican community as well as they entered into New York. A lot of them went elsewhere as well. Mm -hmm. You know, Puerto Ricans mainly came to Chicago. They came to New York. They went to Philadelphia. They went to Camden. They went to all the places where you had laborers. Okay. And so when the migration division was set up, Joe Montserrat was the one that ran it. He was the one, number one guy. And when he left, Manny Cassiano took over. Mm -hmm. When Manny went to become economic development, uh, in charge of economic development for Puerto Rico under Governor Luis Ferre, he appointed me to run the migration division over here because of the history and how things happened. And so I knew why people were in all over the place. Mm -hmm. You have people in Japan. You have people in Oahu that came. I mean, you have farm country in all those places. And so I would go to all these places and follow these footsteps of what Joe Montserrat started. Joe was excellent at doing what he did, brilliant. And he kind of set up everything and I kind of inherited the attorney, a fellow by the name of Alan Pearl, a Jewish attorney, who was involved in all employment activities and knew how to deal with all these people because he had done it already with uh, Joe Montserrat, mm -hmm. had done it with Manny. And then when I took over, I kept it. And so I used to travel with him. And he used to tell me, we got to do this, we got to do that. Why reinvent the wheel? Mm -hmm. That this guy knows what he's doing, and I can talk to all the other commissioners that were labor heads, like in Massachusetts. I used to go there and talk to the commissioner of labor. And uh, my office really was the Department of Labor of Puerto Rico. I fell under them. Only thing is that because Manny and I and the governor became such good friends and we were we had a plan for Puerto Rico and in the United States they left me alone. And I would report directly to Manny and to the governor. Uh, unfortunately, they left out the loop of the Department of Labor. Uh, there that's was a reason for that's it. That's when you headed the Puerto Rican migration. That's when I was I had it, that was in 1970, 71, 72, right? And so we were able to do a lot of things. And I had my offices on 45th Street, but I'm divert, I'm diversing from everything, but I, I'm trying to kind of put it all together. Mm -hmm. So you see how things are growing and things are beginning to happen. So that as time goes by, my connections that I receive because of my father, I was able to continue the good work of what my father had started. And so it was very, very difficult. It wasn't easy. I'm making it seem as though, right. you know, it flew, everything flowed into each other. It didn't. And believe it or not, my father and I would clash because he didn't want me to open up more travel agencies. He felt that we had enough. And I felt we got to get there before somebody else does. And so I actually read a case in law that had to do with a travel agency that was doing franchising. And I kind of liked the idea, and that's when I talked to my father about franchising and opening up. And so my father fought me on the first office. The second office we opened up, father didn't want it. But I went ahead and did it. He told me, it's your fault if something goes wrong. I accept the challenge. 
it wouldn't have been my fault, but he wanted an out. You know, he didn't want to sure. be the guy that screwed it all up. And so I was, right. the, I was the guy that would take the blame. But actually, once I opened up, he was right there. And he would take over. And I said to myself, oh, wait a second. So this is the way he goes. So I would go to the third office, and he would come in. And so it was great to have someone that knew what he was doing that didn't want to fail take over your responsibility. And so my responsibility became opening up all these offices all over the place and getting volume. And Pan American grew, and then American Airlines grew. Trans-Caribbean came in. And so we all of a sudden became so big to all the airlines that when we finally were able to get a travel agency certificate representing all of the airlines, we were in high demand. Eastern Airlines, Pan American, TWA, uh, you mentioned it, Pan Am, all these airlines, they wanted the Hispanic markets. They saw it growing, 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 growing. Mm -hmm. And none of the American travel agencies that were here wanted to get involved in the Hispanic market. Why? Because Hispanics didn't book hotels and they didn't book cruises. And if you didn't book hotels and cruises, you could only get the commission of five or six percent of an airline ticket. How much was an airline ticket? There was a time it was forty-five dollars. Wow. So five or six or seven percent of forty-five dollars? So three dollars. Three fifty? Yeah. So you needed volume. We had the volume. And you didn't get rich, but you stayed in business, and you're always fighting with the airlines. Give me a little bit more. Give me a little bit more. So what did the airlines do? When they started seeing that too many airlines came into the market and they couldn't survive because now all the business was split up, so they come to you and they say, you know what? We'll give you the 7% but we'll give you an extra 7% if you sell my airline. Got it. So then you say, hmm, very interesting. Now, if Pan Am is there, you got to fill up their flights anyway because they're the ones that put you into business. My father would not take a penny until that airplane was filled. Got it. Once the airplane was filled, my father would say to me, okay, now we sell Eastern or we sell the other airline. I forget there was another airline. So, unless Pan Am, so Pan Am didn't do anything for us at the beginning. When they found out that they were giving back end commission, so I remember that my father went to see. In those days, uh, one trip wasn't there. It was a guy named Jack Lillis. And Jack Lillis was the one that negotiated with my father out of goodwill and told him, look, I don't want you, you know, to lose money. And so he gave my father, my, he asked my father, what is it that they are giving to you? And my father was very honest and told him exactly what they were giving. And so Pam said, we're going to give you the same thing. He could have said, and they're giving me 15%. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have known. But my father wouldn't do that. I actually think he did the right thing because the airlines eventually find out because all of a sudden other travel agencies, you know, they saw the business we had and people tried to open up and they did. Mm -hmm. And so they couldn't take the business away from us and the airlines saw us giving all the business to Pan Am and so they sponsored other travel agencies. Before you knew it, there was a war. And so now if a travel agency opened up, up in Hempstead, New York, so I had to open up there too. Right. And that's how we got to 52. Not because of that, but because other travel agencies, they were getting big in places we weren't. And I said, it's only a matter of time before these people now come after our business once right. they know. And so we got to go after them before they get big. And that's what we did. And so we opened up wherever all these people were. And so nobody could ever become 
bigger than what we were. And the airlines didn't want to lose our business. And so they act, they acquiesced mm -hmm. and gave us. And the profit was not in the airplane tickets you sold. Where the profit was getting these airlines to take an airplane that was flying with 172 seats and have them give you 100 seats for sale, which meant 72 seats. Everybody else had to sell those 72 seats while I had 100. Got it. And so if I did that with every airline, I had two thirds of every seat that was flying to Puerto Rico and then to Santo Domingo. So no matter how big an agency got, they had to divvy up the amount of seats that were left over between 20 or 30 other agencies. While I got my 100 seats, when the jumbo planes came in, we got the plane, wow. the whole airplane. And so just to have other people not say anything and the airline didn't want to have the problem. So they would put 677A flying out at 7 a.m. Right? Mm -hmm. That was my airplane. 677B flying out half an hour later. Nobody knew, but 677B was our airplane. 677, and that one flew out half an hour later. So you have three jumbo jets flying out, 7, 7.30, and 8 o'clock. So you push all the seats that you sell into the first airplane, fill it up. Doesn't matter if 30, 40, 50, 75 people are left at the airport because 15 minutes later, you got another airplane, 677B. The airplane you got to be careful about is 677C. Because okay. after that, the next airplane don't leave until 12. And so if you leave anybody over in those in that last third airplane, they have to wait to see to get onto the air. But you have the same situation. And so nobody knew about those extra airplanes. They were ours. Okay. And we would sell them all because all these travel agencies, they couldn't get a seat. So people, even if they went to them, can't get you the seat. You better go to Cafrizi. Can't I can't sell you the seat. So we had a monopoly. And so we grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And even Eastern Airlines gave us. After a while, when everybody noticed what was going on, Eastern came to us. They gave us an airplane. You know, not as many as Pan Am. But eventually, Trans Caribbean came in. Pan Am left the market. The sad one. Trans Caribbean came in. Old Roy Chalk. And so Old Roy Chalk became my father's best friend. He owned El Diario. Okay. He also owned the pipeline and he owned the Washington, D.C. transit system. And so Old Roy Chalk was heavy duty. Poli not a politician in the sense, but big business guy. Mm -hmm. he, was, he was one of the first billionaires, you know. He loved my father. And my father and he, he would come into town. And uh, he would help my father out. He would go get, go have coffee at our house. My mother would make him coffee. We had a table, a little table like this. And he would sit there. I would give him my chair. And my father would sit because there was only two people to sit at the table. Right. And then my mother and I would kind of, we had one of these kitchens where you had a counter and we would get on the other side and watch them while they talked. Holroy Chalk brought Robert F. Kennedy to campaign for my father when he ran for assembly. Wow. He's still lost. <laughs> sure. Okay. But they sat there having coffee in my house, my father's house. And that was in uh, Drugs Nick at that time. So if you look at the history of the Hispanic market, who brought all these people into New York and New Jersey? Who, who moved them? 
Cofresi. Cofresi. We had the offices in Puerto Rico, and we had the offices here. So now, all these people, and when Joe Montserrat was there, and when Manny Cassiano was there, and the farm season ended, where did all those laborers go? Because they weren't working anymore. Do they go back to Puerto Rico? You don't know the answer. No. I don't. Nobody, right. So what do you do with them? Because Puerto Rico doesn't want them. Right. Why? Because they can't take care of them. What are you going to do with laborers? There's no jobs. Puerto Rico now is doing good because they got rid of all the laborers. Right. And they don't have to worry about them. They gave them to New York City. The one thing is Puerto Ricans were never welfare people. If you took welfare because you needed it, because you're down and out, you took whatever you can get. The majority then wouldn't take it because it was a handout. No one took it. My father never took it. All his friends, all the people that I knew in those days and the conversations that I heard, nobody wanted it. Only if you needed it. Mm -hmm. You needed it to survive, you took it. As soon as you could, you got off of it. And so what happened was necessity. Because of that necessity of having to support your family, you had to get a job. And you weren't going back to Puerto Rico. There was nothing there for you. So one of the things that Felisa would do is come into town. Felisa? Felisa Rincón. She was the mayor, the mayoress of Puerto Rico, of uh, San Juan. Right. Over here, she was considered the... Luis Muñoz Marín was the governor of Puerto Rico, but Doña Fela, man, that was the biggest thing since uh, ice cream. Right. Because she was very compassionate, loved her people, and she was always, she had, she was a diplomat. And she knew all these big wigs. And Irma Vidal Santaella was an attorney, and she knew how to deal with these people. And my father was a businessman. And between these people and others, there were other people that were involved, they started getting jobs. So that when the farm season ended, these people would come back, they would come back to our office looking for jobs. Hey, can you find me a job? Can you do this? Can you do that? And so we would farm out. There were people who needed just people for delivery, mm -hmm. people to do stupid work, but they needed them. They didn't have them. And a lot of these Hispanics in those days, uh, they were good working with their hands. But they needed to learn. And a lot of them learned construction. A lot of them went into a lot of f different fields. And there was an Irish guy, I can't remember his name, and he was the head of the Pontiac Democratic Club. Uh, right across the street from our office, Cunningham. His name is Cunningham, Bill Cunningham. And Bill was friends with my father. And so my father would send me with the people that came to uh, the office so that I would take them to Bill Cunningham and Bill Cunningham would get them the job. Why? Patronage. All these people, I'll give you this job. Don't forget who gave you the job. It was Bill Cunningham, okay? But how did you get to Bill Cunningham? It was through the Hensia Cofresi. And so word got around. And so Bill Cunningham and my father became very good friends. And in those years, over here, you had Tony Mendez. Okay. He was the district leader. Okay? And you have, well, she later, Senator Mendez, Olga. But that was later. But Tony Mendez, who is the district leader over here, there was a lot of Hispanics coming into Spanish Harlem. Mm -hmm. Why? Because when the Hispanics started coming here, the Puerto Ricans, it clashed with the Irish, but it was good with the Italian, Latin, mm -hmm. right. Italians, Hispanic, and so on and so forth. And to some degree, they got along, not completely, right. but 
the guy that was here as the, um, was he the assemblyman or congressman? Um, uh, is, is Federico? Tu estás ahí? Ven acá. Ven acá, siéntate aquí con nosotros. Porque tú eres una persona también que él te quiere conocer. He's a guy that you should know also. He's coming here so that we can talk. Pastor Crespo. Coge ese asiento ahí. O, o siéntate aquí. Sí, ahí. Siéntate aquí. So, we'll discuss. We had a meeting. Or we have a meeting. As soon as I finish yeah, no the sentence. But uh, Federico has been around for a long time, and he knows all the players in the political field. Mm -hmm. And when we go back to Tony Mendez, when all these laborers finished their contracts, okay, in the fields with Shade Tobacco and Green Giant and all these big companies, mm -hmm. they came back. What do we do? We had to get them shelter, just like what's happening now. So my father met with Tony Mendes over here. And at that time, there was a fight with the Irish okay. because they wanted to take control and the Italians were clashing. And now the Puerto Ricans were coming in. So Oscar, ¿cómo se llama el Oscar? El, El que es el asambleísta o el congresista de aquí. Oscar. Oscar. His name was Oscar. Can be Mother Oscar Garcia. Okay. No. I'll, I'll let you. I, I just got a short, short second. That's second. okay. So anyway, so what happened was that all these people, they started leaving because there were so many Puerto Ricans coming in and who was getting them the apartments? So my father got all the buses, and then with con un acuerdo with Tony Mendez, Democratic Machinery, district leader, with the powers that be over here. Oscar, you look him up. Oscar, Oscar, Jesus Christ, he was the first. Uh... So anyway. So they started getting empty apartments because a lot of the Irish were moving out. Right. And so they were taking those apartments. And so we were shipping from our agency when the ship, because the buses came to us. Because the contract, when the bus, at the beginning of the contract, they had to pick them up at our office. When the contract ended, they had to drop them off at our office. What do you do with all these people? Every bus had 50. 52 people, right? And if you get two or three, if you got Shade Tobacco, Green Giant, and other people sending buses, you got to get rid of them. You got to put them somewhere. Mm -hmm. Well, all these apartments that were here becoming vacant, Tony Mendez and Oscar Nieves, or I forgot his name. Oscar Garcia Rivera was a huh? assembly member. Oscar Garcia Rivera. Rivera. Yeah, well, that's Rivera. Rivera. That was the guy. He was, he, what was, he was he? the first. Puerto Rican Heritage Assembly member. Assembly okay. member, okay. And, and, then Olga, there was, and Olga was the first female. Yeah, but she came after her husband. Yes. Remember, correct. he died. Correct. He correct. died. Okay. So, so what happened was now you had all these people coming in. You know, they're not going back to Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico doesn't want them. And the Puerto Ricans here, they say, I don't want to go back because what am I going to do? But where do I stay? Okay, get in here, and my father would take and drive over here, and I would come. And in those days, it was um, how, how it was like a circus. It was it was it was lovely. How, how the bus went over there, and they would come back and get more people, and they had everything, all the apartments, everything, where everybody was going. Now, you didn't get an apartment for yourself. You got an apartment for four, or five, or six, or seven people living there. And cuts. What you got was a refuge. You had a place to sleep. And so all of a sudden, if you you don't know this, but well maybe you do. If you know how Puerto Ricans in Spanish Harlem were depicted 
So the joke was, hey, did you hear 20 Puerto Ricans died last night? No kidding. How did they die? A bed collapsed. Okay? So how do you kill cockroaches in corners? Huh. You get a Puerto Rican because they used to wear the shoes at the points at the end. Remember the shoes that were right. like this and then come out? So every Puerto Rican had a knife. Why? Because a cherry. Yeah. And you're telling machete. Yeah. Yeah. Even my uncle. He used to go anywhere. And the first thing he would do after he put on his pants, he would take a knife about this big and stick it into his pants and go out to work. Every Puerto Rican, that was like having a revolver. Right. They had a knife because they knew how to use it. Okay? So what happened? They said all Puerto Ricans have knives, they have switchblades, they have la curva, the curved knife. Right. And they made them into creatures that were undesirable in your neighborhood. The Puerto Rican why? problem. But why? There's another reason why. Because they had the right to vote. Puerto Ricans had, with an X, they, could, they didn't know how to write their name. But they could put an X. Mm -hmm. You understand? And so, Irma Vidal, Doña Fela, my father, and I was kind of watching everything that was going on in those days, because all I did was absorb in those days. That's why I can tell you these things. And so, because of the vote, that's why Spanish Harlem became Spanish Harlem. So that Oscar Rivera and all of the other non-Hispanic politicians could stay in power. Because otherwise, they would be taken out. Spread out. Yeah. So what the Irish did is they left. They went north. They were the first ones to go north. Okay? And whenever the Puerto Ricans tried to go north and cross the Willis Avenue Bridge, there was a fight right there. So let me see. How, where was I? So uh, anyway, so what happened was that all of this that happened here in Spanish Harlem was possible because of Tony Mendez and his powerful district leader position. And as you will soon learn, maybe from someone else uh, when he gets interviewed, uh, you will see that Hispanics were beginning to become at least recognized, maybe not for uh, they were recognized for their sheer numbers at the beginning and it was like something you can't stop you see it coming so you got to get ahead of it and so a lot of politicians that were in areas that were gentrifying with hispanics saw that the future their future depended on the vote of these people and most of them were Democrat because from the very beginning, when they showed up here, they were helped by the Democratic Party. Right. And so they kind of lingered and became Democrats forever. So the one thing that was very important and uh, which my father and Irma and Doña Fela and uh, Tony Mendez and uh, others that at this point I can't recall, but there were others. There was a movement that they wanted to take away when the Long Acre Act was enacted. It gave Puerto Ricans American citizenship, and they also could sign with an X if they couldn't sign their names because they were American citizens. You can't take away their right just because they can't sign. Right. But what happened was that there was a movement to do that. And so with Tony Mendez and Irma Vidal Santae and all these people grouping together here, they were able 
to put up a united front. And I actually remember I was a kid, but I was taken by my father on the buses that he paid for to go to Washington, D.C. to protest over the fact that they wanted to take away the right of being able to sign with the next. Mind you, you're still a Puerto Rican citizen. They can't take that away from you. But they wanted to limit your ability to vote. And so it was fought. And while in Washington, they threw the dogs. And I remember that. And I remember when, after a while, nobody left. And so Irma, my father, Tony, and some other people, I, could, I was not allowed in. So I stayed on the line. And my father and everybody else went in there. I wish I knew what the hell happened. But they were there for over an hour and a half. And they came back out. And uh, that's it. We got into the buses and came back. But we were there for like two days, maybe three days. And then all of a sudden, resistance kind of stopped. And it was reaffirmed that the Puerto Rican could vote with an X. There's no question about it. You're an American citizen. So now, if you're Italian or you're Irish or you're anything else, you're a founding father, but you can't, you can't write your name, they're going to take away your right to vote. Right. You're here. You're the ones that came. You started this nation over here. They're going to take your right away. So why are you going to take it away from the uh, Puerto Ricans? I mean, you already gave them. Puerto Rico is a commonwealth of the United States. And you already gave them authority with the, uh, with the, uh, with the, it's the Lone Acre Act, I think it is. The Foraker Act? Huh? The Foraker Act? Yeah, I'm, I, I can't remember it. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you already, you gave them the ability to able to vote. You didn't limit them to an X. Right. So no, you stopped it. Just another extension of the literacy test that yes. they imposed on Southern blacks. Yeah. And that, that goes into another story. But we're going to stay with this one for a while. Because when I was named as the uh, uh, as the migrant chief over here, when I became with the Department of Labor and I took over the National Economic uh, Development uh, Center. The Puerto Rican Migration Division. The Puerto Rican Migration Division. So while I was there, I had another discriminatory situation. But now... At that point, I was already 27 years old, 28 years old. And so wow. I said to myself, I'm going to fight this. There was discrimination in the police department with Hispanics. Why? They didn't let Hispanics into the force because they were too short. And at that time, I got together with Benjamin Ward who was then commissioner of corrections. And at that time, it was during Rockefeller, I think. Rockefeller was in, he was governor. And Wagner, I think, was the mayor. But anyway, I was good friends with them through the offices. I was always involved with uh, Wagner and uh, with Rockefeller. He used to invite me to Pocantico Hills. He used to take me by, to give me power with all the other people that were there. I was too young. Everybody else was a seasoned veteran. He would put his arm around me and walk with me, with his arm around me. And then everybody would say, hey, Nick, and this and that, you know? So he would kind of transfer power, imaginary, by the fact that he was befriending me in that way. But he was smart because through the office, we had about eight or 10 different departments in contact with all of the Puerto Ricans that were here, especially in New York. And they all voted. They were American citizens. All you had to do was get them out to vote. That was the hard part. Right. Okay? So I established a voting center in the department where I put voting machines downstairs. And then I tried 
to get as many Puerto Ricans as I could to come in to practice how to vote because it wasn't they didn't want to vote. They are afraid of the machine. It's like you're afraid to drive. You know, it's not hard, but you got to get over the fear. Right. And all these people, eran buena gente, but they were afraid to vote. We had to get them over that fear. In those days, it was Gomercindo Martinez that was the commissioner of elections. And he gave me the machines to put into the office. And I had rallies come in with people downstairs voting and then get back online or come back again and vote and vote and vote and vote. And our voting numbers went up like crazy because all of a sudden people know how to vote. They know how to press that lever. They know how to pick the person because they made it very difficult for people who didn't know for you to find out where you can vote and how you can vote. Right. They switched the lever and put the picture on the left over here when you were actually voting for the one on the right or vice versa. And so there were a lot of tricks. So you had to know what you were doing. So we were able to educate a lot of these migrants and a lot of people that were not, uh, didn't have the education and they were fearful. And so that was very successful. But as far as getting, uh, it, it was Ray Ramos, right? You remember uh, Commissioner Ramos? He was in, uh, he was the commissioner, deputy commissioner of corrections. Joe Ramos. Joe, Joe, yeah, Ramos, Joe Ramos. Joe Ramos. Joe Ramos. So he's the one that came to me, and so we brought the government of Puerto Rico through me. I spoke to Governor Ferre, and I spoke to Manny. I said, I want to do this. Run with it. They gave it to me. They let anything I wanted to do, as long as I let them know, they would let, they would support me. And so we started running with the fact that you cannot stop a Puerto Rican from seeking a job because he is under five foot four. You can't do that. Do you do that with other people? And so a lot of people were there before this five foot four regulation was put in place. And so we started hitting the ranks and started going after the police department as the migration division, as the Puerto Rican affairs, you know. We went after them, went after the police. Then the police put me on their, uh, they had a, a commission. And they put me on the commission over there so that they, with the commissioner. And I would go in there and I would call the commissioner aside and say, Commissioner, this is wrong. You can't do this. And so he eventually took my side. And then he started supporting. But I didn't sit there and criticize him in front of everybody. I didn't do that. And so he always said to me, you know, that I did, the, I did it the right way without kind of, um, how would you say, uh, sorry, you, you don't want to humiliate. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I kind of, I could have gone after him the way Ramon used to do. Oh, Ramon was a people. Okay, but uh, I didn't do it. Yeah. But Ramon was always in the background. With me. Correct. Uh, Joe Ramos was in corrections. Right. And then he was in police. Right, then he was And post. then Benjamin Ward, I mean, yeah, I think Benjamin well, Benjamin yeah, Ward was the commission. That's a commission. Because that's who I got with. Correct. And then they, there was a problem problems between the Benjamin Ward and the Puerto Ricans. At one point, even Benjamin Ward says, this, you know, these Puerto Ricans, when they ask for bread, they also want butter. Yeah. So there was always a friction with Benjamin Ward. And yeah. I think you handled it the right. right way at that time. Right. Where it didn't become a confrontation but it became, this is a solution to a problem. Yeah, because they wanted the Hispanic vote. Correct. They, they, you know, they, they want to keep as much as they can and not give it to you, but they have that excess that they can give to you, but you got to fight for it. So anyway, we won. And uh, as a result, I was, the, I was, when we won the first graduating class in the police department, I was the speaker as as the national executive director for the government of Puerto Rico. I was the speaker at the first graduation 
class of people who were there below the height limit. And we won. But I learned all this from the old man, my father, and from these pioneers that didn't, they didn't stop. You know, if you told them no, why not? If you said, well, why not? It's this reason. Why? As long as they felt that there was something wrong in your kind of decision, you had to prove. Otherwise, they were still on the case. Eventually, they wear you down. But it takes a long time to the point that you finally accede to what other groups are asking for. And then you go to something else. But you hold off, and you hold off, you hold off for a year, two years, three years, you see? And so then you let go. Why? Because you got a new issue. And somebody has to defend that issue. And so it's time to start fighting against it from the other end. And you try to hold back people from coming in. Mm -hmm. And you keep doing this until you can't. And it starts all over again. All right? So this is a never-ending battle. It happens to all migrants, immigrants. It happens to everyone. Because don't forget that a lot of people who are coming in are going to take somebody's job away. They're going to take someone's neighborhood away. Because all these people want to gentrify so that they can be one in their own community. So now you have Muslims coming in. And so you make it hard for them. But eventually there's enough Muslims that they get a block. And then it's two blocks. And then it's three blocks. You go into the Bronx. So you keep out the African-American in the Bronx because it was all Hispanic. It was an accord. And that's when uh, Charlie Rangel, uh, the, the congressman, and um, everybody else, because you stay out of Central Harlem, will stay out of there. But now it's fair game. See, so now Central Harlem goes into the Bronx. And then come all the progressives. And everything gets split up. Excuse me. Everything gets divided. Because everybody wants a piece of the action. It's, you know, this is all uh, natural. If you look, you know it's going to happen. Right. When? And for how long? Can you hold it back? What can I do in order to gentrify them and work together? Because after you fight and you see you're losing, you got to agree to agree. So now comes negotiation. And then a lot of people, they just go find another place. They start all over again. Nothing is new. It all depends how you handle it. And if you understand history, and that's why this is important, you can see that things that have happened before are happening again. All that changes are the players. But the game is still there. It's played differently by different players. But the end result is always going to be that there is a beginning and there is an end and there's a new beginning. How you learn, how the battles have been fought will determine how you're going to fight the new battles. If you don't learn, then you're a fool because it's only going to repeat itself and you're not prepared. Mm -hmm. So you've got to learn from your mistakes and you've got to learn from also your successes. So how did you succeed? What things did you do that were right and what things did you do that you wouldn't do again? And how did you negotiate if you negotiated with the Italians and today you have the Muslims, so learn what you did with the Italians so you can deal with the Muslims. There are different there's always something different with each individual community because our cultures, they clash sometimes. But we have to take the good that they have along with the good that we have. If you try to take everything away, then you're going to have a fight. You know, do perro. Mm -hmm. 
don't guide you. They're all going to fight the moment that two of them met that pico. So you got to learn how to do that. It's all comprehension. You got to learn how to be able to deal with people. And it's hard. It's not easy. So anyway, and going back to the old man and everything that he did, uh, I got to tell you that it was a wonderful group of people that I grew up with. Ramon Venice, my father, um, Joe Erazo, uh, Congressman Rangel. You know, Congressman, Congressman Rangel, to this day, we're good friends. He's half Puerto Rican, you know, and he's half uh, um, uh, African-American. Okay, American black. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, he's a bit Spanish, but he takes care of that portion that he feels most uh, uh, comfortable with. And he's got his people over there: Basil Patterson. He's got uh, uh, all, uh, Keith Wright. Keith he, they, they're all together, mm -hmm. and they have their own clique, and everybody forms cliques. How do you deal with these clicks? The Dinkins, 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 Sutton, Patterson. Yeah, Sutton. You know, they yeah. were all in, you know, um, people of power. Yeah. You know, and, and, and don't forget um, um, Danny Farrell. Oh, and Danny Farrell, big. So, you know, here I am in East Harlem that I came here back in the 80s. I bought this building. And who were the people that I dealt with? So, Angelo Del Toro. And I became good friends, and his brother, William. And so, in those days, Olga was here also, Olga Mendes. And, and there were a few other people that uh, were here. So what did I do? I was no longer at the government. I'm in business. I had the travel agencies, and I had uh, other things that I was doing. And I said to myself, you know, how can I help? Well, you know... Charlie and I were good friends. We had no reason not to be. I called Charlie. I told Charlie, how can I help you in Central Harlem? Oh, Nick, you can come down over here anytime. And, you know, he took me all over the place, introduced me to, when I remember going to uh, Ruth Chris. Not Ruth Chris. Uh, what's the name of the uh, Ruthie's, Ruth's house? The one that's in Harlem. Um, I forgot her name. But anyway. So there's a restaurant there. And the I Red Rooster, there. there was to be No, no, the... was, so, Sylvia's. Sylvia's. So I went to Sylvia's, and I went with Keith Wright and Charlie. And we had a great time. And, you know, if Charlie called me, I was there. If I called Charlie, he was here. He never said no to me. It's amazing. Yeah, but, you know, but you, I think because of your father and people like you, the Puerto Ricans retained some kind of status and power, even though it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, doing the things that you guys did organize, you know, the, the business sector or organize or help. Because what happened is, and just use the battery, which I, we know best and right. close to our heart, the, there were the Mendes, there were the Rodriguez, there were the Nasagastis, there was the Toro, and there were all of them, you know, and, you know, there were other, you know, people, other groups, or the Costa Brothers. So there was a lot of business and there was a lot of politicians. The problem that we failed to do is that we never nurtured anybody to take over our power. And it got, exactly. you know, and that's what we failed as a community. Because what happened is we we became so engulfed with, um, with our own division within our own power, you know, because we still had, you know, everybody was still fighting. Yeah. Not fighting, but they were very... Uh, Bickering. Exactly. Yeah, Over, bickering. you know, they just didn't know how to sit down, get together, and work out details. And that's what we felt as a community. So I'm glad that you're bringing out, you know, your father and, and people like you, because you guys were the ones that carried the baton when there was that vacuum of leadership that we didn't nurture. Because I'll give you an example. This community lost $65 million dollars I think it was 65 million dollars when Olga lost the campaign. But that never became to fruition. That's when the Serrano son, you know, ran against yeah. it. And that's okay, you know, that's what we're supposed to do, you know, challenge. But then instead of Serrano be running for his father's seat, he just stays there. So there goes the power. 
So you, you know what I'm saying. So there's not that transition of power and as sophisticated and the, and the reason for it is because we were the pioneers here in the political arena, but we just didn't know how to cortar el bacalao, right. you know, and that's where I, I say again, to like maybe the fourth time, you know, you guys made an instrumental for us to stay as viable in this community, regardless of who was in the political arena. And, you know, that, you know, Thank you, one. Thank you, Father, and all the leaders. Because there, was, there, there were the many, many good leaders. Um, I mentioned before uh, Malave. Oh know, yeah, from yeah. Brooklyn. Uh, but there were a lot of people. Goya, you know, Valencia Bakery. Uh, you had l business leadership, Correct. but it for some reason it just didn't take hold, in the sense that. It meant that we would continue to stay as we grew in power. Uh, but you're right. Uh, other people have come in and they've taken uh, the baton uh, and they're running with it. Now. But we opened the doors. Yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. The, the doors, doors were open. We, and we, by the way, we were always able to share power. Yeah, we did. Uh, and I'll give you an example. Adam Powell supported Adrian Espanyol right. against by America back in the days. Right. I run elections for Adrian Espaillat because I thought that we had a good chance to win that particular seat because Adam and we felt that, you know, and I'm not saying that, you know, Brian Murta didn't do a good job for that community, but that community was changing so fast that we felt that we should empower someone that was going to address the needs of that, you know, new, gen you know, new generation, newcomers right. into that neighborhood. So we, you know, we always hear power. Even though you know later on, you know it, it, it looks like the, you know we we never really struggle among all the people. We always share. We always help along the way. Right. So the right. Puerto Ricans were the ones that opened the door and really didn't um, try to, you know, um, cannibalize that community or try to hurt that community. It was the opposite. We tried to help with that. And community. we built it up. Yeah. We tried. So there is a lot. I mean, this conversation it can go on forever, mm -hmm. but uh, we tried a lot to be able to be as respectful as possible to everyone and to achieve success by diplomacy and uh, trying to get as many Hispanic. I think we also kind of fell behind um, leadership when our sons and daughters went to college and came back and they really didn't want to get into politics they Correct. mostly well, got into well, well they became doctors and, and lawyers. they moved out of the neighborhood yeah and they moved out of the neighborhood too. so so it were, was a gentrification we, we, of were, a different we, we were heard by our own success actually, yeah, actually you know that's right you know which is what you're trying to address right. because we instead of us investing in our community, which a lot of them got busy, I mean, after this day, you're still in this community. Yeah. But the ones that became affluent and got educated, they moved out of this community. So I think El Barrio, even today, the, the dollar still doesn't circulate as much as all the neighborhood because everybody comes in from the outside. And we go in. from here outside. Correct. Yeah. You know, and we lose a lot of money yeah. in this community. Well, you know, there's a lot of idiosyncrasies, and it's hard to kind of put your finger on, one on any one particular item. But uh, what you see is a rundown as to how the community began, the purposes of the people, uh, how it is that they developed the people that came as migrants over here, and finally, there's no migrants, and now they're all business people with small businesses, bodegas, supermarkets. Uh, now you see the Puerto Rican all over the place, but you also see other Hispanics because even banks now loan to Hispanics, whereas before you would go in and they wouldn't give you anything. Mm -hmm. So now you, are, you you're a substantial depositor. You're someone to be reckoned with because of the numbers and because now the purchasing power. You know, Corporate America power. understands purchasing yeah, power. Yeah, it's in the billions. So the more, and we're all over. Absolutely. We're all over. 
And this is the beginning of something else that's opening up, which means that as we look at Florida, how many Hispanics from here have moved to Florida? And how many Hispanics from Puerto Rico now move to Florida instead of to New York? How many people from Chicago now move to Florida? How many Floridians move to South Carolina and North Carolina? How many people go to Los Angeles? So now you're getting a mishmash of all these people going to different places which need different requirements. But you have to also mention the Cubans, because the Cubans were here big time, especially but that was, uh, in the restaurants. We in, in the, well, be, in, before That's that, they, they, they used to own the butcher shop, porque eran españoles yeah. mixed con Cuban. Yeah. They used to own all the restaurants. If you look at most of the restaurants, in the, in the Cuban world. La Floridita, La Caridad, and then the Dominicans took over the, it was like a franchise, because yeah. you see Caridad's yeah. all over the place, but you saw that transition, because Cubans had their own, you know, um, social structure, yeah. because the Cubans that came in, you know, were educated. When, yeah, well, the kid, it was money that came out of Cuba early on, and you remember the story. Saralejis, you had they had the vanidades en español, from all over, and they handle you know, you all they those control. all the Cubans that most of the Cubans that came in already knew correct what they were going to do, Absolutely. they were already educated. educated, many of them had businesses very successful, and they were just going to replicate, and they understood they politics exactly. like nobody did. They, 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 yes, they were very intelligent when it comes to, well, don't forget that also uh, you have Cubans that are Sephardic. Correct. And they uh, kind of help each other mm -hmm. more so than some of our own people help oh, yeah. each other. Uh, there's the family structure there is, uh, you've got 10 people in your family, they all have to be successful, Correct. otherwise we all sink or swim. Correct. So there's a lot of things that sometimes our families don't do. Uh, don't forget I own the Cuban Day Parade and I'm a Puerto Rican. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had to get a Cuban partner because the Cuban said to me, you're a Puerto Rican, how could you own the Cuban Day Parade? And I said, you're right. Let me find a Cuban and George Masco. Of course. For so many George years. George became my many partner years, and I owned years. the Cuban Day Parade with George for 14, 15 years. Yeah, but it was... There was no Cubans here anymore. But it was... There you go. But it goes... They went to Union City. There you go. That's and then from Union did. City, they saw two Salvatorians or two sometimes. Then they right. went to Florida. And exactly. they just, you know... And then you got to remember, I'm going to give an example. During the elections, they killed the, the orange ball with Republican voters. Yes. And then became <laughs> a power and they became, you know, the construction. <laughs> that was Mascanosa and the group yes. and, you know... So, but at the end of the day, the Puerto Ricans has been partners with a lot of different groups Absolutely. and a lot of different uh, Because they can get together. Correct. They kind of blend into and try to kind of help each other. Yeah. And, and I Puerto give Ricans it, are very good. I've been deeper. And, and I give you an example. On my, on my family side, the, the Los Tio Politico, they went to Pennsylvania to work on the coal mines. Yeah. And I'm glad that you said earlier, because I was listening, that when they were apartments here, they daban un mes de renta gratis. And then a lot of the Puerto Ricans, they used to work in Pennsylvania in, in you know, labor or, you know, in, in, in the fruits or whatever. And the coal mines, because some of my family did, yeah. the other uncle said, mira, New York están pagando y, then, you know, we can get an apartment, we can do this. And then, like you said, when one Puerto Rican had an apartment here, then he will invite his brother, his cousin, or somebody sure. to the same apartment, which was, remember, the the Red Rose apartments, you know. Yeah, you could just then. get by. And yeah. then, you know, they, you know, you stay there for two or three months, and then you got a job in a factory, or you got, you know, yeah. somebody to help you. And remember, we we didn't have the political clubs, but we had the social clubs. We spoke about that. And then the social clubs used to do that until, you know, the Happy Land tragedy came in and that dissipated. So a lot of the groups that came in, like the Dominicans, age of the, the, the part, you know, the part is here, you know, and the cultural centers here, and they try to do all yeah, that. They so remake. They remake. So, they they, remake. but they have a political structure when they come here. Oh, they, 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 so, they love politics. You know, yeah, they're obvious. And yeah. well, this is the law of the land. Yeah, you know. So. so, more or less, Pastor. 
I'm trying to kind of go beyond now. Uh, so now the Puerto Ricans are here, the Dominicans are here, the Colombians are here, the Salvadorians are here, the Equ uh, Equatorianos are here. So now what we have is one big Hispanic community that is dissected into different areas. And so our big, I guess, uh, point right now is to how do we deal with all this diversity within the fact that we're all Hispanics. Yeah. And so everybody wants to be successful. That's the main goal. Everybody is here because they want to make money. They want to, they want to be successful. They want their daughter and they want their son to be a doctor or to be a lawyer or to be somebody. That's the family. That, that's a probably a great segue now that you, you're speaking about this. You are currently the president and CEO of the New York City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Why was it so important for you to get involved and establish the Chamber of Commerce? How, how, how does that affect the future of the Puerto Rican community? Let me tell you, I did it because I was doing it all my life anyway. <laughs> what I'm doing now is helping people to try to get along and to try to create their own business. So, uh, so what happened is that I saw that there's a lot of people in need of information and also collaboration. And they have to be put together to create their own success. The problem is that a lot of people don't know what road to take. And so they kind of go all over the place and waste years before they finally make it. Sometimes they never do. So I'm not there to create a business for anyone, but I'm there right now through the chamber to be able to uh, somehow steer them in the way they should go with the organizations other than mine that do exist, that they don't have to take two years. They can do it in six months. And they can, if they need money, there's grants. There's a lot of companies, there's a lot of not-for-profit not organizations that can help them start up. So why waste time? All I'm doing is trying to get under the banner of the chamber people to come so that we can put them in touch with other people that can help them get off of the road and start walking and flying. So the chamber is important because I look around and there's no other citywide chamber and the, uh, the chambers that I do see, uh, they're, one band, they're one man bands and if you're a one-man band, you're getting money so that you can live. But you're not taking that money and putting it because you're not making enough to be able to spread it out, to be able to give. You see, I run the chamber. I don't take any money. Because I don't need it. So what I do is, yes, the people who work at the chamber, I make sure they get paid. But they have to look for ways to meet other people that can help other people. So if, for instance, you need a, you want to open up a business at J.F. Kennedy, okay, uh, and you're a minority, well, first thing you got to do is get certified. You can't, if you go to get certified, It'll take you maybe a year, year and a half, two years, because you don't know how to do it, and there's a lot of paperwork that has to be done. Come to me. I will put you in touch with a person or persons that can help you, and I can probably get it done for you in six months at no charge. You don't have to pay anything. So when I look at the need for people that are hungry, for advice and they don't know where to go that's why the chamber is there 
it says New York City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. So if you're bright and you see the title, you call up and you say, you know, I'm having this problem. What can I do? All right, I can either give you advice or I can send you to someone that can get you started so that you can at least know that you're heading in the right direction. Mm -hmm. So now go back. I've been with the New York City Hispanic Chamber. This will be our 18 years. Before those 18 years, I started the Bronx Chamber of Commerce. There was no Bronx Chamber of Commerce. The fellow who had the Bronx Chamber of Commerce was Dick Gidry, and uh, it was closed down many years ago. And for about 10 years, the Bronx didn't have a Chamber of Commerce. The former Bronx Board of Trade. No, that was Mike Nunez. That was Mike Nunez. Different. God. Different. Mike Nunez had the, and I, I, I was with Mike in those days. But the Board of Trade was South Bronx Board of Trade. Mike did an excellent job. Okay, but Bronx Chamber is the whole Bronx. It had to do with the Greeks, the Italians, the Germans, the Jewish, Hispanic, everybody. But what happened? All I was able to do in the years that I had it for 14 years is create a whole bunch of Hispanic businesses inside the Bronx Chamber. The Jewish, the Greeks, they didn't want to come in. Why? Because they felt that we were stepping on their territory and they didn't want that. And even if I invited them to be a part of the board, they didn't trust anybody because it was a business and they make money on it. So they weren't going to do what I was going to do and they had to be a part of, because I'm not going to build something for one person when we have an umbrella in the Bronx for everybody. So I gave it up. And when I gave it up the next day, I started the New York City Hispanic. And all the members that were here, not all of them, but a lot of them, they came here. And a lot of them stayed there and came here. And so I didn't lose much. And as time went on, I gained a lot. But I've been able to help a lot of people. And I don't care if who it is. Because right now in my chamber, I have Jewish, I have Argentinian, I have Colombian, I have Cuban, I have Puerto Rican, uh, I have Greek, okay? They all sit on my board. And if any of them have anybody that they need help with, we'll serve them under the New York City Hispanic Chamber. So what does that do for the chamber? Well, a lot of Greeks. They say, well, I had to go to the New York City Hispanic Chamber in order to get help. Because they don't have a great chamber. Okay, now, you get the same thing from the Italians. Not that everybody, I'm not saying that there's a big portion of them, but if you get out of 100, you get four or five or three that you can help, why not? If you're a Hispanic and you live in their neighborhood and they're thriving and you're buying products from them, and they're making money because they're selling you a product, you should be happy too because you're getting a product that you want and you don't have to go somewhere else to get it. It's right there in your neighborhood. So if you don't support your neighborhood businesses, no matter who it may be, the neighborhood sinks. And then you got to go somewhere else. So you, you have to understand that the chamber takes credit for what it does in all of the different neighbors. But we don't tell anyone that they cannot come. And I, I, I encourage it. And I go to Queens, and I go to that Queens, uh, Queensboro Plaza, is it? Uh, Astoria Plaza. And I sit there with the, with the people. They made me a Greek a happy. Imagine, a Puerto Rican, a Greek a happy. As far as I know, there's only two. And we were both sworn in together, which is Tony Orlando and myself. Because he's Greek, Puerto Rican, and so am I. I'm, I'm not Greek, I'm Puerto Rican. Right. So I take the credit of 100% Puerto Rican, he has 50-50. He has right, right. 
But as far as I know, I don't know of any other Greek Ahabians, but I have opened the door for other Hispanics, because right now we're talking about other people who are, they should be, because they deal with money. These Greeks are very, they're very wealthy, and they're very business. Open stores. So unless you're afraid to deal with other neighbors, and other neighborhoods, other people, you're kind of limiting yourself to dealing only with your people. See, I, I deal with everybody. I deal with the Jewish, I deal with anybody. You know, put a lot more, todo mundo. Right. Because I don't look at people as being uh, uh, someone different than me. I see everybody as an opportunity to be able to open the door and for me to do better. So I kind of opened my own door. And I think that's the way that we have to approach life. But the chamber itself, it's an open, it's open. Beautiful, beautiful. I'd like to bring you back to just uh, a gentleman who's, uh, whose granddaughter began the uh, Legacy Pioneers uh, Georgia. All History Initiative. Let's talk about Georgia George, Rodriguez. Georgia Rodriguez. Could you uh, just enlighten us about your association with Georgie Rodriguez, you know, Community Board One, <laughs> Community Advisory Board for Lincoln Hospital. Uh, Georgie was a hell raiser. All right. <laughs> you know who, right? You want to say a few words about George? Oh, no. uh, George, uh, you know, he was a force to be reckoned with. I uh, have a lot of respect for him. Yeah. Uh, people got to understand uh, where he was, that that whole neighborhood went through a big transition. I don't know if you remember that whole, um, you, know, uh, you know, area where um, basically uh, gentrification was a big issue. And, you know, I remembered. Um, I was in Lincoln Center. Correct. Not, not Lincoln Center, Lincoln Hospital. Lincoln Hospital. Oh, from Lincoln Hospital. So there's, there has been a lot of transition. Uh, Georgie, um, Georgie was um, bien orgulloso, but he also stood his ground. Oh, yeah. You know. Um, no tenía pelo was, en la lengua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He siempre andaba, tú sabes, con su pena ahí. He comes from the old crowd. Yeah. I never saw my father without a tie. Even when I visited him at home, I couldn't see him. He, he'd go into his room if he saw my car, and he would be in pajamas, and he'd come out spiffy with a tie and everything else. I, you know, I think I've seen my father maybe twice or three times without a tie, and that's what Georgie, Ramon, all these people in the old days, all these old timers were like that. Yeah, when I when I met Georgie, he was, um, you know, was um, I was involved with Adam, and uh, you know, he was very, you know, very fair, very honest. Um, if you had something and it went on the board, and it was to um, help the community, um, he was a hundred and fifty percent for it. You know, he didn't he didn't shake anybody down. You know, he was always a gentleman, but he knew how to use power. Pero era era duro. You, you couldn't bully him. Yeah, no. You couldn't bully him. He was you very, he, he was uh, very upright. He, yeah. he was the kind of a guy that told you what was on his mind immediately. He didn't yeah. think about it. Yeah, there was no, there was no, there was no two ways about it. Yeah. You, you saw, and okay. he was what you saw. He didn't. And he was it. in everything, because he was with Ramon. Correct. Ever since the beginning. Him and Federico, and, uh, and he was on a lot of boards, but Ramon trusted him. And, um, you know, it was that group of people that were kind of dispersed within the community and put on different uh, boards that would respond to Ramon. And very loyal, very loyal, very outspoken, good guy. I mean, I got nothing to say bad about Georgie. He was always good to me awesome. all the time. So Georgie, I love him. Love him. And he even took me when, uh, you know, when... Uh, he had uh, the, he was, I don't know what like to say, but you know, when he was losing, uh, had a little bit of Alzheimer's and so right. And I remember that he wanted me to go to Lincoln uh, Hospital. And he said, I'll meet you outside Lincoln Hospital. And we went outside, and there he was waiting for me. And then we went into a board meeting that he had called. And so I think out of the board, only about three people showed up out of something like 10. And I tell you, he went nuts. 
he went nuts and so on. He made everybody go out and find these other people. <laughs> he was the kind of a guy that during his prime and when he was actually, uh, well, you can't fool around with him. He knew what he wanted and he would fight for it. He was a fighter. They don't gallo. I like to say gallo because the old timers were gallos. They were the kind of people that if you knock them down, they just got back up. And you couldn't keep them down. They would die before if they would not capitulate. And so I remember that uh, all these people, Ramon, all the time, I remember coming up and going like this. I remember my father. He, they were all like that. It's like they all saw the guy you the way that the, the guy you got it and put out a chest and did everything. And they would fight. You could tell by their actions. But you, you also have to remember that at that time, there was more, and I hate to say it, but there was more um, concentration of power in different ethnic groups. The construction was controlled by the Italians and some of the groups. So I go back to yeah, what the you world said. World. Absolutely. But I go back to what you said. We were the pioneers to open those doors. And then we made alliances exactly. with, with the different groups like Amity Association, Monetary Enterprises, or Nat Singleton, who allow us to take and then you know, Puerto Ricans. The labor unions. Yeah, the labor, labor unions, unions the same thing. Going on in brass. Absolutely. But people don't realize that we we paid them. We, you know, we we used to fight them, you know, and, you know, we opened the doors to a lot of other immigrants to also have the right to join the unions. And then nothing became easy for us. No. So that generation had to fight uphill, you know, step by step by step. So First you got one guy in. Right. And then you got two guys in, and then you got maybe five or ten in, and then you started getting more. Yeah, but, but you it was a process. To, but they have to and pay the dues. Unions. They had to pay the dues. They you have, have to, to be. Dues. You had to work twice as much. It wasn't because you were Puerto Rican they're gonna let you in. No, you, you had, had to, to work twice everything. as good as the other guy. Nothing was given to us. We had to fight it, and we had to prove ourselves as we went along, and we became. It became easier, but not at the beginning. Yeah. It was very hard. Yeah. Very hard. Breaking, That's when I breaking down saying, doors was very difficult. Absolutely. And and you couldn't go, the Puerto Ricans couldn't go to certain neighborhoods because I remember, you know, if you went on the east side and the doorman saw you, he'll chase you, you out Bronx, to call the police. This is the Bronx Historical Society over here. If you went into Throg's Neck. Oh, forget about it. Right? If you were a Hispanic and you went to Throg's Neck, they would kill you. You know, no question about it. And here, uh, my father buys a house in Throg's Neck, <laughs> in Calhoun Avenue. And uh, I remember that when we moved over there, I don't look uh, Hispanic. So uh, I, it was everything was fine until they find out that you're Hispanic. And that changed. And then things started to change a little bit. But in the end, it was OK. But it took years, Throg's Neck. If you look at Throg's Neck today, it's practically all Hispanic. But if you look at Drugs Neck in those days, it was all Italian. But you also have to remember that the Puerto Ricans went through an epidemic of what we know the epidemics to be, because we went through the, um, you know, unfortunately because of the war and a lot of problems, you know, the Korean War, we went through the Vietnam War, and, you know, a lot of the guys coming back, they came in with different problems, you know, then there was the drug problems, you know. First, we saw the heroin problem, yeah, then we right. saw the crack cocaine problem. That's a whole, the, that's a whole. You know, the AIDS problem. I'll give you an example. Back in the days when. But was, everybody was affected by Yeah, absolutely. But we didn't understand it. And then we didn't know, even the, the health department didn't understand the disease. I'm talking about AIDS, where they will remove sometimes the toilet because they thought that, you know, that was, you know. My point is, we were. The first one, but we're also the first ones to suffer from these changes of this, you know, epidemics, and I call them. And, you know, unfortunately, that was because of the drug situation and a lot of different situations. Yeah. You know, because people don't realize we didn't come into what we have now. We came into devastated neighborhoods in the 70s when the Bronx was burning, when, you know what I'm saying. And, and you Charlotte, know, and Charlotte the, Street. There so you when, go. So, you know, we, when President Carver. Correct. Uh, so. Okay. So you remember that, and that yeah. was a big team. I, I was there. I was there. So we have we have experienced all the different changes 
also what it is today from back then, you know, so we have lived through it, you know, and we were here, so we had to pave the way, we had to fight our way, we had to survive, you know, yeah. you know, our own way, you know. So. Which is kind of strange to me that the president of the United States in that in those days was Carter. Right. Uh, he came down and to look at Joe. Remember right. that? Uh, that's off Freeman Street. Absolutely. Under the L. There are pictures, and, and the yeah. it looked like like a bomb went out, yeah. and the buildings were yeah. all burned out. Yeah, and there is, I mean, you look at the poverty, you look at the conditions of housing, you look at what is happening, and in those days, you're right, a lot of people didn't understand the drug problem, and that affected the housing problem, it affected the way of life of people that were living in those neighborhoods, because they were under, they were in a war. So, yeah, those are very tough times. But all I got to say is that we survived. We made it. And we had a lot of businesses around that corridor, Southern Boulevard. Uh, yeah, they kind of showed uh, Charlotte Street, but that was that neighborhood that somehow was dilapidated and it was torn down. I don't know how the hell it ever got to that condition in that neighborhood, but the rest of the neighborhood was right. But remember, they were vibrant. But remember the, the the mom the mom and pops you know the bodegas. When I first came to America, I worked in the bodega of the Rivera Brothers yeah. on 101st Street on Manhattan Avenue. Yeah, yeah, so, it, right absolutely. Right. So if you, and I remember, if you wanted to work, somebody gave you a hand. Somebody yeah. tell you, oh, mira, están cogiendo a doorman or you know or a porter or they, they look out for you. They look out for you. So there was that network of people trying to make it better. So. When we came here, we didn't just come here because remember the factory started closing in Puerto Rico. Um, you know, because my mother was one of those who, you know, the factory closed there. Then we come here. Then we suffer because they, the, down by Lafayette, all the Libby brothers, que le llamamos pisue, la gente que trabaja en la factoría, because they used to pay them for pieza. Yeah. You know, then they took the jobs out and then we went back to Puerto Rico because there was no jobs here because they had closed the, the Lafayette. But the, the, now, the you cutters stay here. You go back to Puerto Rico, and what kind of a job you find there? There was nothing there because right. that was the same time that the work <laughs> that the corporations was supposed to pay money after the tax um, ten year grant or whatever. So what they did is they now they took those factories out to yeah. China and yeah, that was the nine thirty six. The nine thirty six. So yeah. we we suffer because of the change of the corporate. I don't say corporate greed, but it was corporate greed, where they find, you know, that they can do the labor at 50 dollars an hour versus two dollars, three dollars in America. But then they kept the jobs of the the pattern makers, but then the factories, and then they had a deal that well, they, all of the they had all the pharmacies left. That's, that's where the money was. Absolutely, that's, Puerto Rico. Exactly. because remember, after ten years or whatever, they were supposed to pay some kind of tax. Some of them went out and came in with a different name, you know, because they had that. Yeah. But then when we lost that, then that was a, a big, a big uh, travesty to, to now, our people. Uh, are we familiar with 936? Yes, sir. Right. Because the economy of Puerto Rico was being run mainly because of 936 and all the pharmaceuticals that used to be there, Pfizer. All these people employed a lot of people who made a lot of money. I mean, in, in in today's standard, when I say a lot of money, they didn't become millionaires, but they had become middle income, right. and so they could afford to live um, respectfully. No, it changed. It changed the lifestyle of the Puerto Ricans. I give an example. I never met my father, who were you know because you know, unfortunately the 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 mistakes of the grown up, the kids paid for it. But you know. But what I hear from my uncles um, and people that grew up with my father, because I never knew, um, he was a, a mechanic uh, on the Perpamate company. And they have Perpamate in Puerto Rico. Yeah. Because he was trained in Puerto Rico. He was a very smart guy. He was, uh, you know, like he always the number one in class and this, that. He became like a, a self engineer. Then he used to travel in America fixing the Perpamate machines or setting them up. So you were absolutely right. That changed the dynamic 
because now they're making real money. They got the union carbide, which is going to be in Puerto Rico, and the trains, and the train, you know, the, the, the labor, and then the labor now can can transfer what they learn in those factories to Main Street America. So they, regardless of the fact that we work at Vida, they work into the land, to, you know, to, you know, in, in Pennsylvania, some places. But we also had now a, a skill that we could transfer to the states. Yeah. So that opens door, and that changed the dynamic of the Puerto Rican city. Okay, uh, Astor. Yes, sir. Tell me. We are running out of battery, or, or I throw another one in, but we're out. So we'll go ahead and uh, we'll end the interview with this one last question. Uh, and I know we're sitting here in between 3rd Avenue and Lexington on 116th Street of El Barrio, but you're very entrenched in Bronx history, and so is your father. What does the Bronx mean to you? Well, I mean, the Bronx, to me, is my home. I was born there. I lived there all my life. Uh, I came here in 1980, 1982, when I, when I purchased this building. But I go back to the Bronx all the time. Uh, as a matter of fact, right after this, I'm going to the Bronx. Uh, so when I look at the Bronx, that's where my childhood was. That's where all the people that I, we have spoken about, they were there. So I can relate uh, to something that I see today actually transitioning. I see gentrification going on. I kind of like to see, like for instance, Mott Haven and North Bronx, they're beginning to develop after having been kind of down for so many years. Right. So, uh, the Bronx is special. I mean, special in terms that if you take any other borough in the city of New York, I really, uh, I mean, well, Manhattan over here, but uh, really my heart is in the Bronx. So I, 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 I know it backwards and forwards, and I know all the players. And uh, when you look even to uh, today, when I do the banquet for the New York City Hispanic Chamber, I do it at Maestro's in the Bronx. Uh, most of the activities that we do, we do it in the Bronx and in Manhattan. Uh, some Brooklyn. But uh, really, the Bronx is a powerhouse. Brooklyn is a powerhouse. And I find that uh, somehow I keep going back to the Bronx. So I may be going somewhere else, but I wind up in the Bronx. So. The Bronx means my life. I cannot talk to you about all these things unless I have been in the Bronx all those years and met all those wonderful people that made up what and who we are today. Could have been different. Yes, sir. Other people could have been there and other people could have made life very different and uh, the Bronx would be in a different uh, atmosphere than today. I don't know, but I do know that uh, Good people pass by there, and there are a lot of good people there today. So whatever it is, the Bronx is not going anywhere. We are, mm -hmm. but the Bronx is always going to be there, and uh, I'll always love the Bronx. Great. Thank you. And notice, the Bronx. That's right. Not Bronx. That's right. Absolutely. And you got to put that capital in the yeah. also. <laughs> yeah, but right. before we sign off here, your business associate, just to get your full name. Oh, I'm Federico people. Colon. Um, known me for a lot of years. He's been a mentor to me. Um, he was actually, uh, he's always been a friend to me and to the community. I don't think there was, um, um, I could tell you for my own, I could tell you that a lot of different groups came here, the Mexicans came here, and he supported the Mexicans. When at one point out of five Mexicans that used to come to El Barrio, four of them were for Pueblas, in Puebla, Mexico, okay. you know, and, uh, you know, he, he, he embraced that community, so he's always been, you know, with the Dominican community. All I know about Nick is that he always has a hand to extend to people. I also know that when this community, or we needed support for, you know, because it's always, you know, tragedies and Nick, I've always says, I'm here. 
and his father was a pioneer as far as I'm concerned for everything that he did, that he just, you know, like, who, who will understand que un, como digo yo, un jibaro como yo, puertorriqueño, was going to have a corporate mentality. You know, that's awesome. You know, and back then, you know, that speak volume, and at the end of the day, the, 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 las puertas que abrieron los, los, los lugos, you know, so that goes without saying, Nick, thank you for always being there for us. <laughs> awesome, awesome. That's loyalty and you know, honesty. But the, you know, you got to be the same person you are all the time. You know, people change, but that's not who you are when you change. You got to be yourself. And you got to understand that uh, people need help. Not all the time. But in time of need, you're able to help. I think it means a lot, more so than if you give money. So I know the old story with the guy who teaches his son how to fish, right? That's right. And after that, he doesn't have to worry about him because he can always get his own meal. So you, you just do the best you can. That's what I, no ulterior motive than to be able to get over the hump of being able to help someone and moving on. That's all it is. And then you do your thing with when you're talking business, you do business and you do whatever you got to do because that's business. And that's what you do. But not everything has to be that way. And so we're happy with people like Federico and a lot of the people that we've mentioned uh, this has been our family for the last 50, 60, 70 years. So <clears throat> what can you say about people that uh, do well for others? I, I think in the process, they help themselves. Great. In the process, they heal themselves. Yeah, they heal themselves. They heal themselves because a lot of time it's about healing. Yeah. Because that's what, you know, you, you know, people like you and your father did, they, you know, they were savvy business-wise, but they also extended their hands and they helped, you know, the community. And whenever there was a tragedy, um, you know, a tragedy in our community, you guys always said present. So, you know, that goes to, you know, I, I, I say healers, you know, and, you know, so that helped those that have themselves. So you're a businessman, but at the same time, you, you knew the balance and, you know, your family knew the balance. And a lot of the Old timers knew the balance because they knew how to describe you, how to, you know, they have an otro vivi, you know, they, you know, and they, and if, listen, if you work hard and you were loyal, they will share the power. They wish, you know, they, 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 they knew how to, you know, show the same respect back to you. It was the way of the old timers, and, you know, it, you know, it's, it's, it's embedded in us. Repeto. Yeah, more than anything else. Thank Numero you. uno, repeto. So I thought you were going to say, and they will come, <laughs> you know, you know, the uh, movie uh, with the uh, fields of dreams. Oh, sure. I, you be, uh, they yeah. will come. Yeah, yeah. And they will come. Yeah. So you were going along that line. So I yeah. expect you to say, and they will come. <laughs> Thank you, Federico. Well, that was... <laughs> Anything else? I mean, yeah, we, we still have battery life here. So any closing statements, anything about, you know, uh, the, the importance? Man, to me sacado jugo. <laughs> I, what, can, what else can I say within the context of what you've already mentioned yeah, everything else is repetition uh, I'd have to go into new stories well we, we thank you uh, we, we thank you for this bit of process <laughs> he probably has something to say different well the, you know one of the things that I, that I have to say is that um, in the adversity of, of all the things that's happening to the city the, the new immigrants and all these things you know, is uh, Nick have, you know, we have lived through through, through the different um, groups coming in and living, and at the end of the day, it goes back to, to, to what Nick, you know, has said, but I'm going to put it in words. Mm -hmm. He has always stayed humble. And as you progress in life and you get power, you always stay humble. And then the other thing that, that I admire is, and it goes back to his Bronx roots is when you are what you are done and you have accomplished so much, I think you get so much back when you could go back home. And not a lot of us can go home because
because they never planted that seed. They never show the respect to the community. They never show, and that's what our generation, his generation, and hopefully generations to come will bring on the table and will get out of this is at the end of the day, we have to go home. Welcome home. And that's the bottom line. Thank you, Federico. And some people say they never left. Yeah. <laughs> and Senor Lugo, thank you so much. President, CEO of the New York City Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, president of the Nick Lugo Travel Agency, and so many other businesses. We, we thank you. Uh, at the Bronx County Historical Society. Well, Neil, thank you. Thank you. Thank you also.